The meeting of the Ways and Means Committee is now called to order. Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Alderman Cruz in. Here. Alderman Florida. Present. Alderman Berenger. Yeah. Vice Chairman Williamson. Here. Alderman Moore. Here. Alderman French. Alderman Vaccaro. Present. Alderman Carter. Chairman Kennedy. Here. Six present, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, before we get um, into the uh, budget hearing aspect, we do have a board bill before us this morning. That's board bill 41. We'll take that up first. That's Alderwoman Dion Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's actually a committee substitute. There's, I mean, do you all have a, the committee in front of the substitute? For, okay. Um, do you Let, have let's to take adopt a, it? You don't have. I have. Uh, it was passed. He needs a copy. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got my Okay. Okay. I think we should go ahead and take a motion to I, yeah, I would make a motion that we put committee substitute okay. 41 before us. It's uh, been moved and seconded that we place committee substitute for board bill 41 before the committee for discussion purposes. Uh, any discussion on the motion? If not, Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Owen Cruz Aye. Owen Florida. Aye. Owen Berenger. Vice Chairman Williamson, Aye. Alderman Moore, Aye. Alderman French, Alderman Vaccaro, Aye. Alderman Carter, Chairman Kennedy. Aye. Six I votes, zero no votes, committee substance before you. You may continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, committee substitute 41 is, uh, I actually introduced a bill last session, on the last day of the session, I'm thinking uh, February 14th, 314. It was a, a companion bill. This is the SID for a uh, TIF we've already established in this Cary uh, district plan. And what this, we have a new business um, that's coming in in a 17 acre site. And it is called the Central State Thermo King, which actually does truck refrigeration uh, repair and so forth. And uh, Green Street Properties Development has really been instrumental in bringing these businesses. Loves has attracted, you know, that truck traffic business that we're looking for in that area. As you know, we had Raven Tires and Gedeke that came several years ago. And what this tax collection will go toward is a service road on the site, which is a 32-acre site, correct? 36 acre site um, because there's a railroad track there. So they want to be able to have um, access uh, and not be held up by the train there. But this will build an access road through the site. There is someone else that they're according to bring in on the other acres uh, of the 36 and uh, it's coming along. So that's what this SID will do. It'll bring, uh, they actually are on Shoto they have, it'll bring 40 jobs to the area, so they're relocating in St. Louis because they can't explain, expand where they are, and they're coming to the second ward, which I welcome them. Okay. Are there any questions from members of the committee for the sponsor? Now, I understand there are some individuals who signed to speak. Well, you the uh, Green Street people are here. If there's any questions from the committee, if you may have. Okay. Are there any <coughs> questions from members of the committee? Alderwoman Cruson, you have any, any questions? Alderman Florida? No question. Alderman Williamson? No question. Alderman Moore? No. Alderman Vaccaro? No, but I would, I would go ahead and ask that we pass Board Bill 41 Committee Substitute out with a due pass recommendation if there's no other discussion. I don't believe it's any other discussion. Um, Sorry, Alderman Carter, Sorry. do you have any questions on it? We're dealing with Board Bill. Uh, no, no, sir. Okay. No questions. If not, we can entertain a motion. So I make that motion. Second. Been moved and seconded. It's been moved and seconded that we pass out committee substitute for board bill 41 with a due pass recommendation. Wait a minute. Any discussion on the motion? If not, Mr. Clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman I'm on it. I approve all. Alderman Florida? Aye. Alderman Berenger, Vice Chairman Williamson? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman French? Alderman Vaccaro? Aye. Alderman Carter? Aye. Chairman Kennedy? Aye. Alderman Cruson? Aye. Seven aye votes, zero no votes. Board Bill 41, Committee Substitute, comes out with a due pass recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's thank get you. on with the airport. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if you can, to make sure we all have a copy. <clears throat> Uh, 
Today, in relationship to the budget, uh, we will hear from both the airport and the parks uh, department. We'll take up the airport first, and its representation has come forward. Good morning, Chairman Kennedy. Good morning, team. How are you? Uh, Susan and I will be presenting this morning. Susan will cover the first few things which are uh, mainly related to the budget. I'll talk about those things that we've accomplished in the last year and some of the things that we have going on this year. We do have several team members here with us. If there's questions later on, we have Gerard Slade, our Deputy Director for our airfield and our operations. We have Jerry Beckman. Jerry is our Deputy Director for um, Planning and Engineering. We have Rob Salerano. Rob works for Susan. He's in the Properties Department. And we have Henrietta Brown, and she also works for Susan under the Finance Department. So we'll all be available for questions at the end, should you have them. With that, I'll turn it over to Susan. Is the little mic for me? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't planned. Oh. Well, I think I'll use this one. Thank Here's you. the big one. Though. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, you should all have a presentation in front of you that we uh, hopefully you have. We do. Okay, thank you. The very first uh, page, other than the title page, is uh, referencing the revenue variances. And these variances pertain to page 25 of the fiscal year 15 revenue estimates that you have. And what I did was I took the 2014 budget and compared it to the 2015 budget. And that's what these percentages are that I'd like to go through with you. First of all, in summary, let you know that there really isn't much of a change in revenue from fiscal year 14 to fiscal year 15. And there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, in the last several years, uh, we've had a lot of space changes at the airport between the, uh, with the airlines and bankruptcies and just all around changes, and that's all settled down. In addition to that, last year, in fiscal year 14, we uh, embarked on a new news and gift contract, and that brought in considerable revenue, which is continuing from 14 to 15. And finally, the uh, we had a parking rate structure uh, change uh, last year. So all those things have settled down, and that's why you're really not going to see much of a change. So with that, I'll just go into some detail here. Uh, first of all, landing fees in the major revenue category there's a drop in revenue of 2.2%. Now, you might think that's a bad thing. That is a good thing, and I'll tell you why. Because the landing fee revenue is tied to the expenses of the airfield. So this means the airfield expenses went down, and the airlines pay us for everything related to the airfield. So that's why that's a good thing. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it is what it is. And the reason why that the airfield expenses went down is mainly attributable to utilities, personnel and benefit uh, reductions and uh, some in debt service. Rents, it's an increase of um, a small 1.8 percent and this is staying pretty flat also because in a little while I'm going to explain the expense side of the budget and you'll see that our budget is flat and the rents are tied to the land side and that's what the airlines and our tenants pay and because our expenses aren't going up too much there that's why this isn't going up. Utilities and charges, remember this is on the revenue side, and what this is is we have meters out for our tenants, so we receive, uh, we pay the utilities at the airport, and then we bill back our uh, tenants. The main reason for this is it's based on historical data, this increase, and a 5.9% increase seems high, but it's on small numbers, and it's just really related to um, some of the rate increases from the utility companies, but we're getting our money back from the tenants, and that's the uh, main idea behind this. I'm budgeting a 2% increase in concessions. Uh, this is mainly because our food and beverage concessions have been doing very well in the last year, um, and Rhonda's going to touch on that a little bit. And this is mainly due to the fact that we've got some new restaurants going in, and we anticipate, um, uh, well, we're in the middle of opening a new one now. And we have a new general manager uh, for HMS Host that has made significant difference uh, at the airport and he's really great to work with and believe it or not that's making a difference in our revenue so it just shows that customer service and a good manager makes a difference 
The rate mitigation variance is 0% because according to the airport use and lease agreement, it's always 13.7 million, so you don't see a variance there. Interest, uh, increase of 5.9%. Again, this may seem like a lot, but it's only $100,000 because the numbers aren't really big that we're talking about here. But quite frankly, uh, we've been getting negative interest or no interest lately, so I'll take that $100,000. Uh, finally, parking is about a half a percent increase. Um, let me explain how parking on the revenue side works. We do not expense for parking on the expense side. And what the uh, 18, I believe it's 18.5 million is, is that's net of expenses. Our revenue we take in every year from parking is approximately $28 million. And our expenses are approximately $10 million. And so that's why you've got that net difference that shows in revenue. Uh, pledged PFCs, this is passenger facility uh, charges, and it's 0%. This is not the um, revenue that we take in for PFCs. This is the revenue that we pledge, if you will, or budget to pay our debt service. So that's uh, what I've got on revenue. The next slide uh, is expenses, and that's page 160 to 162 on what you've received from the budget office. And what I've done again here is shown you that we're very pleased. Our goal, the airport director's goal, was to stay uh, with a flat budget, and that's exactly what we've done. And we're very pleased about that. But I would like to go over um, a few of the var large variances. Uh, I've got four of them that I'd like to talk about. Um, the first one is the fact that we um, are saving from 14 to 15 approximately a million dollars because of the changes in the fireman's retirement plan, and that's just for the airport. Uh, in addition to that, we're saving uh, $800,000. We went out for bid this last year after a three-year contract came due for our custodial services um, on the terminals and concourses. And uh, it was a sealed bid, and we saved $800,000 from our last contract. Um, and that started April 1st. The really good thing about that is that um, they picked up all the same employees, the same manager, so we're getting the same level of service. Utilities, uh, we are budgeting $600,000 less than fiscal year 14. This is really a neat thing to talk about because for the last several years, the airport's been striving to reduce our utility costs by implementing um, cost efficiency programs. And what is so neat is that we can see it's working. And um, I'm happy to tell you that it's paying off into the tune of $600,000. Now this again is as long as we don't have any really big rate increases. We had a really big one last year from Ameren, but uh, I haven't heard about any yet this year as of budget time. So between a Constellation Energy program that we're working with with Laclede on, on our natural gas and the electrical uh, rebate program from Ameren UE, uh, this is where the savings comes in. Finally, unfortunately, sometimes costs go up, and you won't be surprised to hear that on our insurance, our property insurance, um, it's, uh, we're into, we do know as of last October that our insurance went up $600,000. Lexington Insurance Company, I'm going to tell you, has been wonderful about honoring our claims with the tornado of 2011, which was approximately $30 million. The tornado of 2013, May 31st last year, uh, that was almost $10 million. And then another major windstorm last August that took off the temporary roofs from the May storm. Um, they have been wonderful in uh, paying our claims. Well, as you all know, what happens is, is when you turn in claims, well, you may not know, but over $40 million, your, your costs start going up, your premiums start going up. So I can tell you that we've been getting our, money, our money's worth out of them. Okay, those are the major variances. The next slide talks about our budgeted positions and how we've been doing there. As you can see, uh, I have on here from fiscal year 11, we have continuously gone down and, and uh, reduced our uh, budgeted positions from 14 to 15. It's another seven positions. This is mainly made up of 
uh, again, vacancies that we look at throughout the year, the airport director looks at them and decides whether, uh, you know, that, that vacancy should be filled or not. Efficiencies, a lot of job efficiencies have been going on at the airport. And just everybody looking at what's going on. We even, and in addition to that, sometimes we combine a couple positions to make one position that we think is, is uh, you know, better served. Um, since, I don't have it on here, but since uh, fiscal year 10, uh, we have reduced our, our uh, positions by over 100, all through att attrition. There's been no layoffs at the airport. And thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to the airport director. If it's okay, we'll wait for questions until the end, if that's okay with everyone. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we'll turn to the next page. Thank you, Susan. And I think you heard from Susan that we've really tried hard, and, and one of the things that we committed to the airlines here is that we would continue to grow the partnerships and work with them in what was important to them. And obviously, cost, lowering landing fees, uh, which we have been able to do, are important to them. So we've worked very hard. I think the, the second other thing is that we've really tried to change the perception of the public about the airport and who we are and what's happening there and that we are an asset in this region that is uh, instrumental in growing this region. So this next page shows where St. Louis is the 30th largest airport in the country. I think I've used this terminology before, but there's 459 public airports in the country. So when people hear that we're number 30, we are still significant in the infrastructure of aviation throughout the country. And I think that's important because sometimes we focus on who we were versus where we are today relative to the industry. And listed below, you see uh, cities that are all smaller than us in terms of the number of seats out of their airports, the number of passengers out of their airports. And I think that's important because we hear a lot as the airport, why can't you be like Indianapolis or why can't you be like New Orleans or why can't you be like Austin, Texas? And I always say to people, would you like us to shrink? Would you like us to, to get smaller? Because they're smaller than us. So this slide is one of my favorite ones and we update it on a quarterly basis and certainly on a yearly basis when the rankings come out because it's important for people to realize that we have a lot of good things at the airport and are larger than many cities uh, that people don't, don't um, understand. If you look at the next page, we have had a good year of some announcements in terms of new markets that are added. Uh, Portland is a new market that's going to be added this summer by Frontier. We're thrilled to death about that. Trenton, New Jersey is a new market. And San Antonio was added in the fall as a new market. In addition, we've seen added service into existing markets like San Francisco, Washington, D.C. Frontier announced yesterday uh, they're doing an expansion at Dulles, and St. Louis will be one of the markets that's served with that expansion. We do have service into Dulles, so it's added service. And then the Caribbean markets. Um, we have been marketing and working very hard with FunJet and Apple Vacations to partner here in St. Louis with airlines to do these Caribbean markets. So they have pro uh, partnered with Frontier for this season. We are flying seven markets into the Caribbean, uh, two a day to Cancun, and then four days a week we're serving a lot of other markets. There's Cabo, there's Mexico City, uh, there's Puerto, Puerto Vallarta, Puerto I think it's part of my yard. Um, and so it's what we're finding is that the more we can offer customers, and FunJet and Apple Vacations is thrilled. They're seeing the planes full. They're seeing their packages being sold. So we expect next year, as those contracts are up for renewal, that we can even see more opportunity. There were two markets that we lost, and so I always think it's important for people to understand some of the, some of the challenges. Those markets were both served by Southwest. Uh, we lost the Louisville market January 1, and we lost the Memphis market no, Louisville was yeah. southwest. Delta is Memphis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we lost uh, Delta pulled out of the Memphis market. They took their hub out of Memphis, and so a lot of cities saw a decline in service. You know, we hate to lose markets uh, because I think it's important to us to have a variety. But again, neither one of those were being served uh, and where the airlines could make a profit off of them. So it's, you know, it's one of those things we try and share with the community. If we get new markets, we have to ensure that people are flying to them. This morning, I just talked with Southwest. They called a while ago. Uh, there's going to be another announcement this morning that's uh, a good story for us, I think. The right amendment is coming to a close, which uh, was a longstanding fight that Southwest had about the opportunity to operate out of their hub in Dallas Love Field. And the right amendment allows them to operate into more markets, into more cities. St. Louis isn't affected by that, but the good piece is, as a result of them being able to make some changes, we are going to get Austin. Uh, this fall, which has been a market that we've been trying very hard on. Right now it is going to be put in for seasonal, but we hope that it can turn into a permanent market. 
and they'll be announcing that they're going to add additional service into San Diego, California. So during the peak season, they'll add additional service there. We will see uh, a net uh, loss of two of the flights into Love Field and one flight into Midway, but we have more than ample service both into the Chicago market and the Dallas market today. So having new destinations and destinations like San Diego and Crees are more important. So that story's uh, breaking in right now as we're, we're here with you. So that's a good story uh, to share. On the food and beverage side, you heard Susan talk about that we've seen a uh, we're budgeting a 2% increase in concessions. We heard from the community very loud and clear that they wanted the airport to represent more of St. Louis in the region and local fare. So we have worked with HMS Host to try and do that and try to give more offerings to more people. If you have more offerings, more people will decide to spend money at your airport just based on what pleases them. So in the last year, we've added Auntie Anne's, we've added Brewmaster, we've added Great Wraps, we've added Grounded, which is sort of a, a fast food burger place, but it's a healthy fast food burger place. It's not Burger King or McDonald's. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice, healthy burger. We've added Jamba Juice, and we added the new Pasta House Schlafly, which just opened in Terminal 2, which is a beautiful restaurant last month. And um, what we've seen is you know, it's just a variety for people. So people who may have not have chose one of the selections we had prior says, oh gee, the pretzel shop is unbelievable. I mean, if you walk by Auntie Anne's, it's got a line constantly. So uh, what we're finding is the venues that we're selecting are good and we are trying to build into it the, the local concept. So on the next page, hopefully everybody heard uh, last month, we made an announcement that Mike Shannon's is coming to the airport. That will open here in the next 30 days. Uh, that's going to be on the A concourse. There used to be a restaurant called Mosaic there, obviously, which was a local Mosaic, closed their operation here in St. Louis. So it's been on, operating under HMS host as just the local. But uh, they went out and tried to find partners. We partnered with them, met with Mike Shannon several times, and they decided that the airport would be a great fit. So we're thrilled to have that. It's going to be a nice high-end restaurant. Uh, they're excited. They're already planning a number of opportunities to have parties and different things out there to, to do the grand opening in, in conjunction with baseball games. And so I, we think that's going to do very well. We also have uh, on the uh, street that I think got released yesterday or today for food trucks in our cell phone lots. Right, Rob? Like Friday. Oh, like Friday. <laughs> he made it. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, It'll be this but, week. <laughs> you know, we, we are trying, uh, we've encouraged people to use the cell phone lots in an effort to make sure that we have plenty of parking for the overnighters in our garages. Anytime you drive by them, you'll see 30, 40, 50 cars in the cell phone lots during peak days. So we wanted to try to see if we could get an amenity. Uh, so for the summer, we thought it'd be a good way to test. So hopefully we'll get some bidders on our, um, when it's released and we'll have some food trucks in our cell phone lots. And then you can come out and join us for uh, lunch one day and we'll, we'll oh. buy you lunch. <laughs> We're also trying to uh, put a wine bar in Terminal 2. Uh, there's a growing demand across airports across the country to have wine bars and that have wine tastings. There's a couple of concepts that are out there that are doing very, very well. So we have found a space and we are hopeful that we can get that on the market and we'll actually have a wine bar as well. So again, it's just that sort of trying to broaden uh, what customers want and where customers will spend money at the airports. On the retail side, last year you heard from us, we put the uh, concession out last year because it was expiring and we wanted to see and we got a great deal uh, when Hudson came in. So it took uh, the better part of 10 months to uh, switch all the stores and build them out. We're happy to say that they are now 100% build out. Customers seem to like uh, the product that they have. We still get a little bit of pushback not having a PGA store because that was a popular one, but that is a brand that Hudson does not carry. It was a, a Paradis brand. But the Eddie Bauer store has got a great look. We've got the candy store. We've got the high-end spectacle store. We've got uh, sports stores, which is doing phenomenal with all the St. Louis uh, sports teams and some of the universities as well, the Mizzou gear. So those are doing very, very well. We've got a St. Louis Discover store, which has stuff from the zoo to the botanicals to local artists. And you know we're just thrilled with what we've been able to bring in. As a result of that, we have seen March over March, and March was the first year last month where uh, you know, we, we sort of made the switch, but we've seen a 22% increase in our sales per employment, and we think that's going to continue to grow. The one thing that Hudson has done is they look at their shops continually, daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis. They get with us and say, okay, we think this one can be stronger. What should we do here? Should we try another marketing concept? So I do think that they're very aggressive. Obviously, they made a, a 
not a commitment, but a, a, a legal obligation to us uh, to pay a significant increase in our, in our MAG. So they're doing everything they can to make sure that they also are meeting that. So they watch the, their marketing program and who's buying what and where uh, it's being purchased and you know, are always looking at placement. The, the uh, non-aeronautical revenues, as we've talked to the airlines and tried to say, where can we form additional revenues? We've had a push uh, as a team on the non-aeronautical side. And even though we've been working on these for uh, three or four years now, last year was a good year in that uh, you know, two of them came to fruition, which were new partners. Spire, which is our compressed natural gas station, that's a combination of a local company, Laclede Gas, and then Siemens Engineering. That's a growing commodity across the country. Uh, they put about $2.5 million worth of infrastructure in to build the station. It is open to the public, but they're also servicing contracts for our fleet, uh, various companies who have a CNG fleet. And what they're finding, much to their surprise, is that they're getting contracts from truckers across the country. So they are way ahead of their projections. It opened in December, and they're thrilled with what's going on with that. So we are a test market for them. They hope to be in a lot of airports in the country in the next few years. So we think that that's going to be one that will, that will serve well. Jetlinx is a new company, even though they started operating in the fall, they were operating out of Signature, our fixed-based operator. Uh, their ribbon-cutting ceremony is next week on the 22nd. Uh, they sunk a uh, million dollars into renovation of a facility. They committed to 800000 but uh, they spent more than that. They didn't realize all the, all the things that they would need to do. But they are a company that manages private airplanes and then sell time. So it's another product offering out of Lambert. So if you're a business and we don't have a nonstop market and it's important to you, several of the companies have signed up with them to be able to have some of their executives um, use this private option. So that's doing well. It's a great facility, and we're, we're pleased to have them. And then Signature, which has been a long-standing partner of ours as a fixed-based operator on the field, they, uh, their lease was coming to a uh, termination, and they uh, brought to us a proposal to extend it for the next 20 years. With that came some significant infrastructure, also some increase in revenues to us as a result of that. And we were able to get one hangar back from them because we had a partner who wanted to have a direct lease with the airport on a hangar, a local partner here. So we got a hangar back. We got uh, uh, greater revenues, and we got another 20-year lease extension. And they're also talking to us about expansion. They're seeing the need. They're getting customers come to them. They are full up. So we believe there's some opportunity there in the near future for them to actually take some additional land and expand. And then one other thing we heard was a need for more conference rooms at the airport, the ability for the consumer to rent places and have conferences or have meetings if they've got people coming in from out of town. So we have one through HMS Host, which is the Vineyard Room, but we also opened one. It's where we do our airport commissions now, so you'll have to come out and, and see it, Chairman. Um, it, it used to be part of the American Airlines Admirals Club, and then they, they kept a club, but they did downsize it, so this space was giving back to us. They had to outfit it and return it to us in good condition, so it's got new carpet, new paint. What we did was went in and found uh, the ability to add a lot of AV to it so that we can offer it's got drop-down screens, it's got TV applications, it's got you know, everything that you need, plug-ins and, and uh, the latest technology to be able to host meetings. So we opened it two months ago. We believe it's going to be a strong revenue producer for us. You can rent it at $100 an hour or for the day, it caps out at $600 for the day. We felt that was very competitive in looking with the neighboring hotels because we have the AV as part of that package. Where at hotels you have to add on AV, it's very expensive. So we're getting a lot of requests and so we think that's going to be valuable valuable in the, in the coming months and the year. And then the last thing I'll touch on is sort of the partnerships and how we're trying to bring the community, uh, both from a business standpoint, but also from an art and a culture standpoint, into the airport and partner. So this will be our fourth year of the Art of Travel event. We have been able to raise over $100,000 uh, to be able to put additional artworks into the airport. This past year, uh, we were, if you have ever ride the Metrolink, we had the beautiful mosaic that got installed at the Metrolink that was an artist out of New York. That was through a grant through uh, Metros to do that. We've also been able to uh, add an, a second art gallery, which will open up in this coming week upstairs. It, 
next week in our lounge area that we'll have at the ticket counter. So we've, you know, we've done a lot to try and, and highlight different things in Missouri. We rotate these art galleries with local artists and um, we uh, have them for the next year. We, we try to do them a year out, so we have like a three month. Right now we've got uh, Made in Missouri in there. So it, again, it, it's things that highlighting local artists and things in, uh, that we have in Missouri. Everybody, I think, heard about our announcement about the Magic House that's under construction now. We, the grand opening for that is going to be next week, May 22nd. You're welcome to come out and join us. Uh, we think that we will be able to submit that for awards all across the country, and we think it will probably be recognized as the best playhouse in any airport, not, in, not just in North America, but possibly in the world. And then another partnership, you know, we opened the new entrances uh, to the front of the terminal in an effort to try and enhance the facade of the front of the terminal, which had been sort of destructed over the years. We put new walkways into it. Those opened up, and Eastman Company, which used to be Solution, came to us. They wanted to partner with us in that uh, because they're a local company, and so they donated all the glass for those enclosures. It was about $250,000. So stuff like that, which is not eating into our cost, is important because those are partnerships here in the community where they feel very strong about. And then I... Oh, did I skip a page? Oh, on the, cap the, the capital <laughs> improvements. I'm sorry. Yeah. If we go back one page, my apologies. Uh, page 11. Just to give you an idea, we are wrapping up the airport experience. Uh, that came in under budget. The last phase of that will open here in the next week with our lounge upstairs across from the ticket, uh, ticket counters. With that, we were able to fund the new copper roof that's being installed. If you haven't been out to the terminal lately, Dome 4 is probably 50 to 60 percent done with new copper. It looks fabulous. Now, that copper will actually patinize over time as well to get the green look, but we're going to have bright, shiny copper for a couple of years. Uh, so that's doing quite well. In Terminal 2, we are also putting on a new roof, and we've done some interior upgrades. What we saw, that was always considered the newer of the terminals. What we saw as we did the renovation in Terminal 1, that it actually was starting to look pretty dull. So we've tried within our existing budget, uh, where can we make some changes? So we've installed more tile, taken away some of the carpet, which is very hard to maintain. Uh, taking a look at new lighting, taking a look at painting uh, the, the stainless steel structures to where they're a bright blue, and that's all been done in-house by the team. Uh, the new roof is, uh, was needed because it's leaking, so that one uh, was a budget item that was fairly expensive. And then the inline baggage system, which uh, was funded hopefully close to 90 percent uh, through a Homeland Security grant. We did have to do a match of 10 to 12 percent on that, but that's allowing the customers to no longer carry their bags. And so in Terminal 1, that opened last month. It will open this month in Terminal 2. With that, we're able to remove those god-awful large CTX scanning machines because everything is done downstairs. And again, that's freeing up space uh, where we can either put, hopefully, uh, to make better operations for ticketing lines or to bring in more artwork. So we have had uh, what we would consider a very successful year at the airport. We certainly have a long way to go in order to try and continue to grow both on the development side and on the, on the aircraft side. But we're starting to, we think, see a lot of things fall in place. So with that, we'll open it up. Again, we have other team members here with us. If there's any questions that you may have about the budget or about what we're doing. Okay. Uh, questions from members of the committee, Alderman Cruson. Thank you, Rhonda and Susan, for the, for the good overview. I would say I, I'm not a frequent traveler, but uh, maybe once a month I'll be at the airport, and I do think it is looking better and better. And, you know, the better the airport looks, the prouder we are of our city, and right. it's everybody's first impression of St. Louis. So thanks for your, uh, thanks for your work on that. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you for the comments. Thank you. Alderwoman, Florida. I agree. Um, I, I think that you've done a tremendous job in shifting the perception, and the airport is looking great. So thank you. Thank you. Alderman Williamson. Well, I guess I'll fall right in line. <laughs> <laughs> you did an excellent presentation, and uh, it was very thorough and complete. I had a question about the copper roof. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a new roof of expansion of the airport, or are we replacing the old roof? It's a replacement. That, that roof was the original when the building was constructed in 1956. So, you know, we've all seen leaks uh, in Terminal 1 over the past few years. And so one of the things, it was a, it was a fairly costly project. 
when we ended up being able to use some of the tornado dollars to offset some of our airport experience costs that we were seeing, then we were able to pull money out of that project. We, we needed to do something with that roof because of the continual leaks, and the fear was as we did all these renovations if we didn't fix the terminal. Uh, so all the copper was removed. The copper was sold as part of the deal to lower the cost of the new roof. Uh, we saved a portion of it, which will be coming out with some surprise with. Uh, we're doing some things to, to, from a mem memorabilia standpoint to have a small piece of it. But it is a, um, the terminal itself is, is not expanding. It's just taking off the old copper roof and then putting on a new one. But it is pure copper we're putting on. Replacing it. <clears throat> now, I guess the rest of the roofs are copper too. And the question I have, what was the cost of the copper roof? And uh, okay. is it necessary to have a copper roof out there or are you just trying to match with the, the uh, existing roof that you already have? Yeah, it, it was not necessary. I mean, we could have looked at some other options. I think there were two things. You know, it is a historic terminal, and although it's not on the historic register, that is something that we've often thought about, uh, whether it should or should not be on there. But as we looked at it and talked about it, had we not replaced with copper, we would have lost that opportunity, and it could have never have been put on the historical register. So the cost of it, Jerry, help me with seven? 6.1 for construction. Okay. Uh, so 6.7 million. But again, because we were able to use some of the monies that we received from the tornado damage, we brought that out of the airport experience. That was bonds that were sold. We were going to have to utilize that money. It was part of the bonds. We couldn't defuse those. So we were going to have to use that money. So we felt this was the best use of it. And I guess when you salvage the old copper, you got a pretty good deal on that. We did. Uh, do you know how much that Jerry, cost? do you know what the cost? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, now, I'm a natural gas with your vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a pretty good savings instead of using, you know, gasoline fuel or diesel mm -hmm. fuel? Do you see a, quite a bit of savings by using the natural gas for, for the airport vehicles? We do. I, I can tell you we just cashed a check for $490,000 uh, last month, I believe, which was a rebate from a federal program for the use of CNG at an airport. So there was a cost initially when those two, we have two CNG stations ourselves. Uh, and there was a cost to build those as we've over the last decade actually been converting vehicles. But what we found is that uh, there is a significant savings. You know, you have that upfront cost, but the return on that's pretty good. Then as other fleets started growing, Alderman, what we found were we had three or four contracts. We were doing an AT&T contract. We were doing a bus contract for one of the parking lots. And more and more people were coming to us. Well, we didn't have the ability with our two existing stations to feed all those contracts, even though they were generating revenue, and be able to keep our own fleet operating throughout the day. So when we decided to build another one, we, we thought, is it should we build it and put the money out, or should we look and see if there's a partnership? So that's why we put the RFP out. Uh, they came in with, you know, put two and a half million dollars in to build that facility. We get a pumping charge off of that. So not only do we get a lease rental, it's about $18,000 a year, because it's not, doesn't need a lot of spot uh, for it. But we get 10 cents a gallon for every equivalent gallon of CNG that they pump. And their contracts are just growing through the roof. So yes, we see a, re we see a revenue source for us on that, mm -hmm. but we also see a rebate uh, coming from the federal government because of our growth of that. That's great. Very and good. it is safe. I drove over here in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing there's less maintenance, too, I guess, when you have the, you know, natural gas opposed mm -hmm. to gasoline. I guess. Yeah, it's I don't a little know, more expensive. Less friction or something like that when it comes to the motors and engines. But. And there are some, like the very large uh, brooms that we use during the winter operations, they, you just can't convert those. They're too heavy of a type of equipment to be able to do it. But you know, most of our day-to-day -day vehicles and, and utilization of all the trucks and stuff we have have all been converted to some form of alternative gas. So our team is, one of the things I will say is we have a very strong team that looks for every rebate and every mm -hmm. program that's out there, whether it be on the sustainability side. You know, Susan, you heard Susan talk about getting Ameren rebates, getting a uh, clean gas rebate. I mean, some of the Ameren checks that we get on a monthly basis have been fabulous because we've put LED lighting in. So you have to, you have, to have people to look at those programs, be aware and dig, but we've been successful in getting rebates from every one of them. Any solar panels? Uh not yet. Um, 
there's lots of, op you know, there, the tax credits for solar panels is about capped out, if not capped out in Missouri. We have looked at several different options on that, but we have not found one yet that has worked for us. And I guess you, you've generated more revenue because of the uh, increase of flights, right? I guess you mm -hmm. lost a couple of flights. You Landed weight. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been helpful mm -hmm. by adding those flights or receiving those flights. Now, I know you say some of those are seasonal. Mm -hmm. what, do you uh, project them becoming permanent, or are you trying to you know, get it where it becomes mm -hmm. more frequent? Well, well, we hope, like today, the announcement was Southwest, which will put Austin, and they serve San Diego, but they just serve it with one a day, so they'll peak that up to the peak season with, with three a day. Austin will be able um, to take a look and see how well it's being served. So they put it in seasonal because they want to test the market. If they find that the market's strong, so it's our job to go out to the community and say, look, you asked us for Austin. It was in our top 10 list. We have about 100 passengers a day that we know are flying to Austin direct out of St. Louis. So what we need to do is ensure the public that we now have this flight. If we want it to become permanent, we need to see companies. So we work pretty closely uh, with, our, um, with our partners here to make sure that the business community understands that now that it's being added, you need to ensure that you fly it. And that will help it continue it. There are some markets into the Caribbean which are always going to be seasonal. Cancun, we fly year-round because there's enough of demand. But there are just markets like that which are going to be seasonal, which are going to be, they'll come back every season, but it's hard to get them on a year-round basis. But we hope that Austin would turn into a permanent. All right, thank you. Very good. You're welcome. Alderman Moore, any questions? I got two books, pages here, questions. Okay. How's our airport rated? What do you, well, I guess tell me what you're looking at in terms of rated. What are, are you looking at a number? All the airports, the, the, whole, the total package of airports, we're number one, two, three, four, five. Well, the, the only rating that's out there is based on employments, and we're number 30. So there's not a rating that's by airports across the U.S. as far as uh, other than your employments. There is a program that we're part of that some airports in the U.S., there's about 41 airports in North America. There's, uh, of that, I think there's 28 in the U.S. alone where we do a survey. And we, uh, we buy the data, they come out, they do surveys. You've heard us talk about this. We just started it two years ago. It's, it's the ASQ survey. But you're only compared to the airports who are doing that. And in that, of the 30 airports in, in the U.S. that are doing it, we're actually number 25. That's a pure customer service standpoint. So what we've seen, now that we have about five quarters worth of data, is what are some of the customers saying, and we've used that data then to try to eke that number up. But again, out of 457 airports, there's only 30 that choose to do that. So the only public ranking that's out there is your employments. It says 254 airports. 457. 457. Is the Bridgeton airstrip costing us any money? The Bridgeton airstrip, the Bridgeton landfill, Bridgeton. The, uh, what we took, the, the, the new. Oh, the new runway? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, there was, there was a debt, obviously, affiliated with that, so we have to pay that debt off. Uh, you know, it's not costing us any more than what was the original thought process in terms of build out on that. What, 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 what helps that is if we can bring more revenues in, obviously, to the airfield side. So the more aircraft we can bring in, the more landed weight we can get, which helps us to, to lower the cost on that side. But when the runway was built, you know, the, the, the bonds were sold and we had, you know, the buyout and all sorts of federal funding and lots of things that went into that. So it's not a surprise, but it is still an outstanding debt that, yes, we are having to pay off. So how is it? Are we using it now? Sure. It's one of the runways we use. I mean, we, you know, do, would we have to use it on a daily basis? No. Could we survive with our other three runways? Yes. But the nice piece is uh, it was great this week. Uh, Chicago had a radar outage on uh, two, today is Wednesday, Thursday. Tuesday they had a radar outage, so we saw 20 diversions from Chicago. So we had them parked sitting everywhere. Uh, we got the landed weight for those diversions, so that was nice. Yesterday, uh, Dallas had an issue with a flight that was leaving from Frankfurt. It was a Lufthansa aircraft, so it was great to see a large one diverted here to our airport. Uh, so, you know, we try and say that we look at it and say, you know, 
I will still be the first to argue that it was a good decision to build it because it's an asset we have in the region. At the time, we did not have enough capacity in our runways for the operation that we were running with the airlines. It's unfortunate uh, that when the runway opened, you know, the operation changed. But as we try and look for, you know, we try to be a premier spot for diversions uh, out of Dallas, out of Atlanta, out of Chicago, because every time they land, that's landed weight. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, when that Lufthansa landed, we should get close to $5,000 for that landing. And all we did was land and fuel, and they were able to take off. So it's important to be able to market and try to figure out how you can, you know, you can get the best uh, revenue for that. But it's, you know, it's, it's a debt that we're still paying off. Uh, I know that the, uh, the terminals was, were due in part from a storm. Mm -hmm. So with the roof also? No. The, we, well, there was a little bit of damage uh, on the roof. The roof was damaged before the storm took effect. I mean, the leaks have been going on for a while. Uh, there, were, there was some money that we were able to get through the tornado that, uh, to help cover the roof, but not the full cost. But because of the other revenue that we were able to utilize uh, from the tornado damage, we were able to save money on the airport experience. And that's the money then we used to fund the full copper roof. There was a plan uh, one time we came out to the airport mm -hmm. uh, on the facade of the, the airport. Whatever happened to that plan? Okay, uh, how far back are we going, Alderman? I mean, are we talking, was that, you talking about since my time or prior to that? Well, we had a, uh, what we were doing uh, since I've been there with the airport experience is we took those, those tunnels, which kind of were these large bubbles, uh, and those have been removed, and we knew, now have these new walkways that I talked about uh, with the glass from Eastman. So they just opened in the last two to three months. That has opened up where you can actually see the domes better now. We've done all the roadway construction out front. We are in the process of putting new, um, what I call the bus ports out there, so for the waiting areas. Uh, and we were able to, again, use the airport experience dollars for that. So we do have new bus ports coming, which uh, ours are pretty old and not the most attractive. So those will be installed here in the, in the next uh, three or four months as soon as they come in. But there was a plan prior that got axed before um, in the 2009 bonds, which was to build sort of a canopy over the terminal. Because of the cost of that, that never came to fruition. It was about a $21 million cost to do that. And that would have been a little bit of a transformation sort of of the front of the terminal connecting to the garage. But that was cut before they ever did the bonds in 2009. Okay, the old Boeing uh, slash McDonald facilities, are we using those? Did we find a, a tenant for those? Not yet. Uh, they are over on what we call the northern track, uh, which does have direct access into our airfield. We've, we've looked at that. It's a very valuable property. The buildings themselves are quite old and have lots of issues with it. Uh, we would like to find a partner that would come in and do the development, whether they raise those buildings and build new ones, or whether they try to renovate them, which are fairly costly. Uh, so, I mean, it's one of our projects that we keep working on. We haven't been successful yet in, but we'll continue to try to do it. It's got a lot of valuable asset because of its assets into the runway. How many different carriers use our airport? We have uh, 12 scheduled carriers right now, and then uh, you get a variety of, like I said, there are some charter operators that will come in. Uh, that's not counting the, the FedEx and the UPS, so we also have a couple on the cargo side. And then like yesterday where we had Lufthansa, but on a scheduled day-to-day, -day, we have 12 carriers. And remember, the number of carriers in the U.S. has shrunk dramatically with all these mergers. So there's only five really legacy carriers out there, which is American, Delta, United, Southwest, and, um, you know, you've got Frontier, you've got Alaska, and all of those are operating at the airport. So the only carrier we really don't have that's a pure U.S. carrier is JetBlue. Is there a special reason why? We keep working with them. Uh, they're highly focused on the East Coast to the South American Caribbean market. So we are on their short list, but we, we, uh, we hope they'll come here one day. Okay, last question. Can we use the conference room when we have international people coming in from like China, mm -hmm. and Vietnamese people coming in, the Vietnam comes in and other places. We need somewhere to shine and show out. We, we, our congressional room is too small. 
absolutely. It's a, it's a great room. It's, um, it's large. Uh, it's got plenty. You can have catering done in there. The catering is done through the airport, through HMS hosts. But yes, it's, it's available. Okay. Alderman Vaccaro. I, just a, really a couple of questions. The, the new conference room, is that in a secure area or not secure? It's, it's not secure. It's, before, it's right as you come off the Metrolink, which comes into Terminal 1. So if you come down that corridor, it's right at the end of the corridor. Okay, cool. And then the other, I know host has the majority or the, the lease for the majority of stuff, but I knew we took back our, kept a few spots. Mm -hmm. How are our spots doing? Well, we have the, the spots that we have a direct lease for is the Pasta House uh, Schlafly, which just opened in Terminal 2. It's been open about a month. They have had a challenge with their liquor license. Um, when you have a, uh, a brew house and you don't have a liquor license, that's a bit challenging. Uh, <laughs> so they're working through that. But they, uh, their food is great. Uh, the look and the feel of the facility is great. It's busy every day. There's a couple of times in the evening where they can offer free beer. Uh, customers love that. Uh, so they've been doing that a little bit until yeah. they get their liquor license. So that, that piece is doing well. The only other direct, that's the only direct lease we have, isn't it? With the, yeah, that's the only one that we have right now. So them and Pasta House? Well, it's, it's a joint. It's, so oh, it's okay, Pasta and Schlafly. So the Pasta House that's in Terminal 1, that's actually through the HMS host contract. Yeah. I, I know we talked about like a donut place going in at one time. I, we're, I'm going back to ancient history. We have two Dunkin' Donuts. Both of those are run through our minority partnership, but that is also through our the DBE partnership uh, through HMS Host. So we have Dunkin' Donuts in, in both terminals. Okay. That, that was really it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Alderman Carter. Any questions? Yes, thanks. Um, what do we, um, I mean, where, where, where do our landing fees rank uh, in terms of other, um, with, with other airports? Are we higher? Are we average? Are we we're below? We're high. We're high. high. So, yeah, we're high. Uh, we know that. Now, if you look, if an airport, when, it, when an airline looks at landing fees, <laughs> it's not the deciding factor of them coming into an airport. It's about 3% of an airline's cost on the landing fees. That being said, we continually want to obviously get lower because we are high. But there's other things they look at. The, the taxi time here is very light. That's a fuel burn. Fuel cost is astronomical to an airline. So if they're taxiing for 20 minutes or they're circling in the air for 20 minutes, that's a far higher cost to them than that landed weight. It also is a, is a pilot cost to them. So if you've got pilots circling for 20 minutes, making $300 an hour, that's a cost. So it's, it's a contributing factor into their overall financial model of whether it works at your airport, but it's not the only thing they looked at. Okay. But, you know, obviously, you know, you don't want to stand out there on the high end, and we are, and so we're doing everything we can to keep eking away at that. Okay. But if I may add, that Southwest Airlines, which is considered a low-cost carrier, is our largest carrier at the airport. So they understand all the benefits, uh, you know, at the airport, you know, and that's why we're always trying to keep our costs in line too, to be able to, you know, lower it. Okay. The other question, because um, I didn't see it in here, um, how much did we spend on snow removal last? Oh God, <laughs> you have to bring it up. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> actually, um, it's not just the snow removal; it's the cost of the de-icing uh, fluid that we have to oh, use okay. on the um, not on the planes. We don't do that. The airlines do on the airfield itself. The and we right. came uh, to the uh, board of aldermen with an amendment. Usually, I budget. I always budget 1.5 million dollars. We had to add another five million this year just for de-icing fluid. <laughs> Breaks my heart. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. I believe we have a few other aldermen, all the people here. Oh, Alderwoman Berenger, did you have any questions? Um, I just had a, a comment. Okay. <laughs> the downside of the fact that it's hard to get direct flights out of St. Louis to most of the cities I try to go to is that I have to do stopovers mm -hmm. in all these different cities. Mm -hmm. And I have now planned what city I'll stop over because unfortunately, which is to our advantage, is that there's a lot of dumps and when it comes to airports out there, and ours is not one of them. Okay. Thank you. So Thank the upside you. is Thank ours you. looks great. We agree. So I just want to tell you all that. You can get to 65 nonstop markets out of St. Louis. <laughs> just I can't get to where I need to go. Okay. okay. I know you go to Hawaii. I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
Any other questions from members of the committee? I do have one. What, so what happened with the Joanne Wayne room? It's being repaired right now. It's, it was right above the roadway, and that roadway was causing lots of issues, uh, in, mm -hmm. including leaks. Mm -hmm. So we had to go under construction for that. And, you know, it kind of looked at this opportunity of, one, we right. need a conference room, you know, to host the commission meetings. But, two, was there some other space? And so when we had this space and it was turned back, we just looked at it. But it will be reopened. Uh, we need probably, what, three more months, Jerry? Uh, and that will be reopened. I think we'll continue to keep the commission meetings in the new, uh, what we're calling the Lindbergh Conference Room, right. mm -hmm. but then the Joanne Wayne Room will still be available. For the kind of yes. meetings? Yes. Okay. Yes. Are there any questions? Any other questions? You had a question? Yeah. All mm -hmm. the flowers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very proud of our airport. I haven't been in it, I think, a month. All the women, every, once a month is pretty admirable. <laughs> um, but, okay. But I had to fly out of Chicago recently because, like she says, the connecting flights, and we chose Spirit never again. The baggage is, is just obscene. So whatever money I saved on a straight flight, the baggage is just ate it up. But I was in Florida and noticed, as the public utility uh, chairperson, that you can take a bottle. I'm not a bottled water drinker, and I think our water is wonderful in St. Louis, but you could take a bottle and refill it at the water fountain. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering where you all, did you have that? Because I haven't been there in a while. And are you looking to do that? We, we, at, we do have water fountains on the concourse. You can refill them. We don't really publicize it. Right. And unlike some of the airports, which actually have these stations, you know, that they yeah. highlight, uh, you know, I, we only have a couple of water fountains on the concourses. There's, there's not a lot of them. It's kind of a slow fountain. It's not some speedy fountain that you push in and it comes down. Uh, it's another one of those things where, you know, you, you look, you're seeing more and more people go toward water and healthy. And so it's another one of those things you just keep looking at. Can we find it? Can we do a partnership? There is some infrastructure needs that that would require. So it's kind of a trade off in looking at that. So we'll take it back and put it on our list of wishes. Yeah. I mean, I know you could fill a water bottle from a fountain, but this was an actual right, designated right. bottle filling mm -hmm. station, which You're was kind of cool. You're seeing in hotels as well. Yeah, too. it was tall enough to where you could just put the bottle there and hit a button and it loaded it instead of trying to catch the water. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> but thank you. That's all I have. You're thank welcome. You. Okay. Any other questions from members of the committee or other older people? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I believe that does it. All right. Well, thank you. We for thank your you time. very much. We appreciate thank you very you. much. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll have up um, representatives from Parks and Forestry. Are they back there? Okay. Mm -hmm. You ready? We're ready. Come right on up. You sure? <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to get started by introducing you to some folks from Parks, Recreation, Forestry I brought down to help with the presentation today. I'll give you a brief overview of what we do, a uh, brief overview of the budget with some key points, and then if you have any questions between myself and the commissioners, we hopefully we'll be able to provide you with the data you need. First of all, our Park Commissioner, Dan Skillman, to stand up, that, everybody know Dan? <laughs> Evelyn Rice, Recreation, Greg Hayes, Forestry. Uh, we also have Alicia Stellharn, who does uh, what we call Playtime Recreation. That's the programs that were f uh, funded through the Barnes Hospital deal and a one eight cent sales tax that built the rec centers. Uh, first of all, uh, let's just take a look at the big picture of the budget. Uh, this year, uh, forestry, uh, Parks, Recreation, and Forestry has been allocated at about $19,700,000. That's a slight decrease from last year where we were budgeted $20,335,000. The good news is the major reason for the decrease is a transfer of the park rangers to the St. Louis Police Department, which was about $1.5 million. So um, the alarm from the big reduction in the park division's budget, uh, just looking at the numbers, doesn't have any impact because of that transfer. Probably if, you, if you've uh, listened to earlier testimony or testimony from the budget division, uh, in order to do the same thing we did last year, maintain the same level of service, 
it will take about 2% more of additional funding. In most cases, uh, the budget approved by ENA accomplishes that. And first of all, I'll start with the director's office. The director's office basic budget is about the same as it was last year, with one exception. Uh, you'll notice a new position, program manager. This is not new money. It comes from a transfer from the street department refuse division. Uh, this is the, re the old recycling manager, if you knew uh, who she was. Uh, they move that position to forestry. They'll be working with Operation Brightside on their recycling efforts and also with the forestry division to look for revenue generating mechanisms where we can sell some of our wood waste and hopefully increase uh, the revenue we produce for the city. Um, this decision was made after discussions with the street department uh, and there was a few other factors but Basically, this is a no net gain. It's a transfer from streets. Uh, the park division, as I mentioned, major change was the transfer of park rangers to the St. Louis Police Department. A total of $1,592,000 was transferred to the police department. That included 26 park rangers, uh, four supervisors, uh, one ranger manager, and uh, overtime and benefit costs and some supply money for uniforms. The one thing that we did do this year, which I want to bring to your attention, uh, we retained, there, there was actually 27 park rangers. We retained one ranger in our budget uh, to serve as a liaison from the park department to the street department. Uh, for some reason, the uh, budget director cut that position out without informing us. It was removed at e &A. Both the police department and uh, myself, uh, Dan Skillman, believe that that part, uh, position is important. And the plan is to only keep it with us for a year during this period of transition. At the end of that year, the position would be transferred to the police department so they would have all 27 officers. And just listening to comments from the number of the aldermen, uh, if anything, we don't need to reduce the number of park rangers. We probably need to increase the number of park rangers. <clears throat> In order to effectively cover uh, our regional parks, uh, I would estimate that it would take at least six additional rangers to do that. Uh, but that's not on the table at this point. Uh, I like your consideration uh, for uh, adding the park ranger position uh, back to the park division's budget for a period of one year. The cost of that, by the way, is um, including benefits is $42,645. So not a ton of money. We actually have a way of covering that cost. Um, we have a position of uh, civil engineer one uh, in our TO. Uh, it's been there for about three years. Uh, we originally thought that the position was needed to help manage a number of our contracts, but by better uh, communications with BPS, uh, we've been able to really minimize the use of that position. Uh, so uh, if uh, you're looking for money, I would recommend re uh, removing the civil engineer one from the budget. Uh, with benefits, that position is $61,000 and uh, the ranger position is 42. Uh, that would restore the one ranger position and leave about $18,681 that I would recommend we add to the park division's overtime budget. That would be super if that could be worked out. Uh, the, the big area uh, where we took some cuts is in forestry. This is a, a reoccurring phenomenon. Uh, basically, $100,000 was cut out of the seasonal budget of the forestry division. That decision was based upon the fact that we didn't spend $100,000 of the money last year. Historically, if you look at our expenditures over a five-year period, we either expended or overexpended and had to transfer into uh, the per-performance budget. The reason why we didn't spend it last year, remember the rain? We can't cut grass when it rains. 
So while the reasoning was we didn't use it, which was true, the reason why we didn't use it is because it rained. Uh, so it's essential that that hundred thousand dollars get added back. Basically, what happens when we run out of per performance money in the summer? We kick, we quit cutting grass, uh, and we know what impact that have. Uh, through the work of the board of aldermen, you've added sufficient money for us to do a sea level job on the lots, and this would represent a major setback. Additionally, there was fifty thousand dollars, I believe, Greg cut out of our fuel account. Uh, you may have heard this from others. They moved the fuel accounts from ESD to the operating departments this year on the idea that if the money was within our department, we would push harder to save money and cut down fuel costs. Well, we did. And I think we saved about $70,000 this year. Uh, what I would propose is uh, that that money, at least $50,000 of that money be restored to the fuel account because if it's not raining this year, we're going to spend all of it. Uh, I believe, is that the last issue with forestry? $20,000 for truck rental? Yeah, uh, also there was $20,000 for pickup truck rental. We add almost 100 seasonal people in the summer. We don't have enough trucks for all of them. Uh, to be transported on, so we rent five, six trucks. I'll be darned. We rent 15 trucks every year. So this gives uh, us the ability to transport the crews to where the work is. So in total, $100,000, uh, and we need in 112, $50,000 in our fuel account, uh, which is, do you call, recall the number, Greg? Okay. and twenty thousand dollars into our rent rental account and that would make forestry whole and allow us to provide the same levels of service as we did in the past Soulard markets budget is basically the same as last year the good news about Soulard market it makes about fifty thousand dollars a year more than um, it requires to operate so we're actually generating more revenue that we need there so that's uh, good news uh, Brightside's budget is included in here. Uh, that's CDA funded. Uh, there's also uh, uh, funding in there and accounts uh, 1116 and 1122, Dan, which is the uh, half cent sales, or excuse me, the eight cent sales tax and the Barnes money. So if you have any questions about those, uh, we can certainly answer it. Uh, the Barnes money, if you recall, require, uh, recall uh, it's $2 million a year from the lease payment for Barnes Hospital. That money is used for park maintenance. Uh, it also allowed us to create uh, the Neighborhood Park Fund, which generates $1.2 million a year for capital improvements for your neighborhood parks and $400,000 a year for rec program. The main program that that funds is a scholarship program. This year we gave out over 116 scholarships to kids 8 to 16, 8 to 16 years of age at our rec, two new rec centers, at Herbert Hoover's, at Matthew Dickey's. Uh, we also have a program with Camp Wyman where we send, send kids free to uh, day camp programs at Camp Wyman. Pretty neat program. In order to qualify for it, you have to uh, be receiving uh, the free lunch program at the schools and some additional criteria, but that's the main one. And as I said, we gave out 116 of them. Uh, with that, are there any questions? Okay, very good. Uh, Alderwoman Crewson, do you have any questions? Williamson. Chairman <laughs> Williamson. Has a nice ring to it, doesn't it, Frank? It sure does. Chairman like Williamson. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank you, Gary. Does that uh, pay more? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just sounds good. I it? understand. Uh, no, I, I guess what I would request is that if uh, you would give me or even other members of the committee the account numbers and the amounts uh, so that we can propose to add the money back to forestry. I mean, it's 
uh, the service that forestry does for all of us is essential to the way our neighborhoods look and we need to have the money to cut the vacant lots and trim the trees and plant the new trees it's all all related to how the city looks so I'd be happy to try to figure out how to add that back in the budget if you give us the count numbers and that sort of thing thank you okay all the woman Florida any yeah. questions yeah, thank you. I was having a hard time keeping up with all that. Um, so I would, I would too like to see that um, restored, but we need the information. I found the civil engineer and he's 41,000. Okay. Yeah, and with the benefits. Okay. No, I know, but I'm just saying that as I tried to keep uh, up. With I'm you. with you. So I agree with Alderwoman Cruson that if you provide that information will do our best to get it restored because you guys do a stellar job. And I you're appreciate essential. that, ladies. You're essential to our um, people. Okay, thank you. Alderman Moore. No, you me. I'm sorry, <laughs> Alderwoman Barringer. I apologize. <laughs> that you were here. I thank apologize. you, Chair Williamson. <laughs> um, I, I too want to see funds restored, but I also would uh, like to see um, what it, um, in the 16th Ward, we paid to have the survey done to show what's going on with our trees. 72% of the trees in the 16th Ward need to be trimmed, 72%. Okay, we can't get to it. So the next thing that happens is we have a huge increase on large limbs falling on cars. I would really like to see how much money the city of St. Louis puts out every time we take out these cars. Because the problem isn't that it's always an act of God. They may have called CSB twice and said, this tree needs to be trimmed. And then, it and then it just destroys their car. So that's a concern of mine. I have to get the trees trimmed, or we can just continue to put out hundreds of thousands of dollars fixing cars or replacing cars. With, on that same note, that's my concern with losing any park rangers. We unfortunately are entering the summer season, and the kids will be out on the playgrounds. And for some reason, I'll never understand, they like to melt slides on those playgrounds. And park rangers can get inside those parks. So I'm very concerned we're not getting park ranger service for that reason as well. And I'd surely like to know how much we're paying to fix all the destroyed equipment and anything else in the parks due to the lack of any oversight in those parks. So that's my biggest thing is clearly forestry and parks. And I want to help as well find you all the money. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chair. we'll get that information for you. Thank you. Dan, did you get that? Yes. Sir. Greg, did you get that? Yes. Thank you. I guess I need an ink pen. Don't I? That's it. <laughs> I'm to go to work. Right. Alderman Moore. Alderman. Gary. That Walgreens Park in my neighborhood that Mr. Brown know a lot about. He mentioned it to me yesterday. We have a park in the neighborhood called Rumbo Park. Yes, sir. I aimed out the lady who fought for, for clean and safe parks. The reason why we call this park Rumbo Park. Thanks, Jennifer. You're welcome. I thought I was. I can hear you. You can hear me. The reason why we call it Walgreens Park, Mr. Brown can answer that. They sell more drugs than Walgreens in the park. I was waiting for that answer. Yes, sir. But it is a horrible sight. It is. It's really depressing to see that park in, our, in the neighborhood like that. And we have that one building that stays open. I need the field done so the Salvation Army can start a, a, a baseball uh, deal. I talked to Dan. We went out a couple times and looked at putting a fence around the area where the players sit. But it's just a horrible place, and you know, and all, uh, for the children to try to play. Uh, you, you made me, or you promised me that you put that track around, and you did that. I appreciate that. But we need to get it striped. Whatever you want, Alderman. Oh, how's that? I got more of that. I better be careful. <laughs> Tuskegee Field. I've worked with you before. <laughs> These lists can get long. Okay, baseball field. Okay. Yeah. Crap. Dan, Dan is working on that, but it's it's not completed yet, and I need to get it done. The baseball season will be over. Weather weather depending, we'll have the field drug, and, and rolled and striped, striped th this week or early down. next week. Right. And then Tuskegee Field needs thrashing. It's it's matted 
down and we don't get enough thrashing. So if I don't request it, no one come to maintain the field. What, what, do, you, what do you call that again? Tuskegee Field. Oh, yeah, it's an artificial turf thrashing. field. Thrashing. If we have the thrash machine. Do you have a thrasher, Dan? Yes. We have the machine. No, we, why don't we thrash that? <laughs> it's, not, it's already trash. It just needs to be thrashed. I'm with you. And Evelyn, the bathrooms in Tandy are not complete. We need the stalls and we need to get the new new sinks and urinals. They're, they've been there since I've been there. I moved in the neighborhood in 1956 in the same urinal. I, I could still use the same one. We talked about the it. Work? We, we allocated some money mm -hmm. to fix that, but it, we, we haven't got it done yet. Dan, is there money for? That was out of the bond issue. We did the, we did the locker rooms. <laughs> We haven't gotten funding out of the sales tax. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up, Alderman. This allows me to bring another issue up. Well, uh, no, no stools, no, no seats on the toilets, no doors in the stalls. Uh, the sinks are rusted. And someone came over and made an observation, said that uh, it, did, it was nice and neat and didn't, we didn't need that. That is uh, amazing how antiquated that those if you recall, if you remember four or five years ago, we spent some money on renovation at the rec center. That yeah. spent quite a bit of Tandy, but we didn't have enough to do everything. What happened is for a couple of years after we had that influx, influx of capital money for six of the rec centers, we spent $9.5 on them. Um, we used to have a set aside of $500,000 a year out of the half cent sales tax to do repair at rec centers, that money went away. Mm. So we haven't been receive, receiving that annual appropriation out of the half cent. So a lot of the stuff like this that you're talking about would have come out of that money. Um, so that's something that's it's probably too late at this, this point uh, this year, but it's something we need to look at. If there's repair work that we need done in those bathrooms, we can get on that right away as far as replacing some of the fixtures and things of that nature using our staff. So if you'd like us to take a look at that for you, we'd be glad to do it. Hello? Did I say the right thing? I'm just, I'm going to get on the forestry. Don't forget that 500000 I mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll call you on the phone. On forestry, I have it. Greg, where they get angry here, like get him. Is that the director? You're always kind, Sam. Oh, okay. I haven't seen him in a while. Nice seeing you. I have a tractor parade that comes down Newstead and Martin Luther King almost on a daily basis, and you know I got over 1,900 empty lots in my ward. If we could just get some of the wards that don't have as many tractors as as or need as many and surge my community just come and do them all at one time one two weeks the street the curb crew comes two weeks later the vacant lot people come or buildings and then after that the vacant lot people come and then it's right back up again on the curb if we can get a surge to make it and especially my main corridors like Martin Luther King and St. Louis Avenue, Van der Venner, and Sarah, and places like that where people are traveling and they see not to hide anything, but if we can't get it, all of it done, let's do the major corridors. Martin Luther King is, is deplorable right now. It's, it's, it, you know, it, it doesn't live up to the name of the, the, the guy that the street is named after. It's just amazing. And the trees have never been pruned or done anything to the tree. We <coughs> had a little guy used to come by about six years ago, but no one comes and the trees are growing all down into the tree well and it just looks bad. But you know, we're, we're asking for service that we need in that community. And when I see those guys, and you know me and you rode one time, man. caught a couple of people sleep, but they have little spots that they go and park and they sit. And then when it's time for them to take off, here they come riding down Martin Luther King on uh, look like a gang of soldiers in a parade heading down the way to turn their tractors in. And that's not fair to the people, to the taxpayers. And it absolutely angers me. I so I would like to see you get a surge, if you can get a surge and clean up that community, you know, a couple times. I know we get three rotations, right? 
On lots, you're getting an, on average of seven a year. Buildings, you're getting a max of three with our resources. But I, if you, if you can arrange some type of surge, I, I would we would be much obliged in that in that community. I can do that. And, and Gary, that hundred thousand dollars that uh, surplus, can you spend it in the fourth ward? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I understand that, but I'm asking for it. Is that okay? No. All of the flowers? Okay. Okay. Give her a 10 and give me 90. No. We're negotiating. Here we go. Okay. That's all. Thank you, okay. Alderman. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Vaccaro? Yeah, I just, um, we went through this yesterday. If on page 249 is the, uh, they actually said that the Parks Department submitted the police ranger budget. In the budget was Parks Ranger Manager, one position, 41730. But they're going to use a police officer. So yesterday when we talked about it, that position, even though it's in there and funded, isn't going to be used. Yeah, that I don't know. If that's the decision by the police. That, well, that was their, that's what they said okay. yesterday. I'm just curious, because then we got to do the proposed cut and put back, which we could, I guess, move that over. Or would it be easier, I'm just asking, to leave that funded and have that person work under the Parks Department? If I understand you, the police said they don't need that money for program manager? They're not going to use a program manager. They're going to have a... Police yeah, they have, they have a sergeant embedded right. with us now. Right, and they're not um, going to do that. Yeah, see, I assumed that they would take that money and, like, pay a portion of the sergeant's salary. But if they're saying they don't need it, that they're, would help solve. They were saying we could put it somewhere else in the department, but they're not going to fund that position. I mean, they're not going to open that position. I guess what I'm asking is, are, are we, if they fund it or put a ranger in that spot, could they go over and be a liaison, or would it be better if we cut well, from there? We and only put need back? a ranger to do that. The reason why I say that, we haven't had a um, uh, ranger manager for over a year. And we've been using a ranger who's a farmer St. Louis uh, police sergeant who knows all of these guys, who knows the police lingo uh, as our liaison, and it's worked out nicely for us. So rather than create a new creature, uh, we would just rather have the ranger, but if that money is available, uh, perhaps that's something that could be used to solve part of the forestry problem. Okay. Okay, and then my other, obviously I've talked to Greg about this, and it looks like if we don't find a way to fund the, the grass cutting back, it's going to end somewhere toward the end of July? Uh, actually, Alderman, if, if we... The equivalent of a hundred thousand dollar cut from existing FY14 budget would end up being a loss of a pay period. So, in my tenure in forestry, we've never stopped before the end of September. With this current budget, we would stop in early to mid December, mid September at the latest, and we would be out of money if all things go as normally do annually. I think we're all committed to try to find that money and put it back. So, anyway, but and thank you and thank you guys for all the good work. I know everybody says it, but. Seriously, when I call Dan or Greg or Gary, things get done. But thank you. Alderman Carter. Yes, thanks. Hey, Alderman. Hey, how are you? Okay. Um, so I didn't get the exact um, um, number of, you said that, uh, that we gave you enough just to do a C grade. What would it take um, to get an A grade? Yeah, we've actually cut it, uh, calculated that before. Greg, do you recall numbers off the top of your head? Uh, ideal world, it'd be about 1.5 million. Yeah, 1 it, it, what we do is we do seven seven cuts a year on the vacant lots. So, and that's probably every three to four weeks. Um, if you think of your grass at home, do you cut your grass at home every three to four weeks? I no, wish you I could. don't. Yeah, right, right. So, I, I mean, that's the reason why I say at best we're a C. So in order to improve the quality, uh, you need to increase the frequency of your cuts. Uh, some, some of the aldermen has been on a committee might remember that it's your request. We added a trim crew to 
blow the grass up out of the street and trim around street lights and fire hydrants, which improved our quality. Mm -hmm. But now we're talking about frequency of cut. And basically, if you took our grass cutting budget, divided it by seven cuts, that's how much a cut would cost. Uh, so in order to add a cut every two weeks, you know, you just have to do the arithmetic, but we can get you that number. Okay. And speaking of the cut and schedule, um, the, the islands on uh, Riverview. Okay, that's part. And I'm pretty sure, okay. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, we talked about this when yesterday, and I'm pretty sure that the older woman from the uh, second ward probably feels the same way that I feel. Um, how often do those get cut? Because, I mean, that's a main street, and it looks bad when, it, right. when it's three uh, feet high. The crews should be out there every 15 days cutting those islands. Okay. And that's, that's both of ours, right? Or is it just right. mine? No. <laughs> no, it's both of you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Williamson. Thank you. Several questions. Um, first of all, I do want to commend Greg for he came out to our ward meetings, and um, I think they do a pretty good job, especially when we have illegal dumping in our neighborhood. So they're very responsive. We appreciate that. I know you guys got your hand full when it comes to grass cutting. Uh, I'm in support of the 100000 If I had it my way, I'd give you two because uh, we need it. You know, and it's we get a lot of. I, that's right. If we could, <laughs> right? Because the problem is, you know, and the grass grows fast, and we get a lot of rain, and you know, we, you know, they blow our phones up, cutting the grass, and you know, the vacant lots and what have you. So you get, you know, you're dealing with LRA, so you got a pretty big job. Um, some of the complaints I do get when they do cut the grass, do a kind of a sloppy job a little bit, like you were saying, blowing the grass around. So if they're doing between the curb and the sidewalk be nice to kind of clean that up sometime because it just blows out in the street and you know it's not manicure well and I know you guys are not in the manicure business when it co comes to cutting grass you just want to get it down but they can kind of sweep it up sometime that'd be great other than that I think you guys do a great job with the little amount of funding that you do have um, Woe Center uh, I know I've been over there several times and they had a kind of something similar to what uh, Autumn Moore was saying I know we lost that money, but they have a heating problem in the locker room. Now, I know we, we did a renovation not too long ago, maybe a year or so ago back, and I know I've talked to BPS, and I think they, I mean, I don't know if they got back with Mr. Skillman or not, but I think they were supposed to give a bid to try to replace the, the heating problem there, and I don't know if they, have they talked to you, Dan, about that, what the cost would be? I don't know of anything. They haven't talked to me recently. I know a couple years ago we went back in and we put supplemental heating in the locker room, and I haven't heard any more complaints. Okay, because I've been over there on several trips, and that was, you know, they were saying, look, you know, we need some help on this, this okay. locker room. But you haven't heard. Now, I talked to BP, I think it was uh, uh, my liaison, uh, Don Williams. Don Williams, okay. And I think okay. he's supposed to get a bid, so. Okay, you let, me, heard let me get in touch, in touch with him. Okay, uh, we'd like to know what's going on with that. What was my other question here? Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's to you, Dad. <laughs> Porta potties. What's the deal on that? And I know you say you're gonna we're gonna put them out after the budget's passed. What's the cost, maybe specifically in Twenty Six? Well, I know we get about three or four porta potties in our parks. Right. And, um, uh, the cost is about a hundred dollars, about a hundred, hundred twenty-five dollars a month. Um, what happens is those are coming out of out of our budget. We just have X number of dollars to do that. A determination was made that porta potties could not be paid for out of your ward capital funds. That was something that came down through the comptroller's office. So okay. prior to that, we had been charging the ward capital funds for those. We can no longer do that. I so see. it's just it's a resource thing. I have X number of dollars in my rental account for those. Right. When we get to this end of the budget year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're pretty much out of money to try to rent those. You said it's hundred dollars a month. You, you hundred dollars a month. Okay, per well, porta could potty. You, could we use the neighborhood park fund for that purpose? They won't let us use any capital funds. Well, why don't we just pass an ordinance that allows us to do that? Mm -hmm. Change the capital fund. Now, the the yeah. neighborhood park fund is general revenue fund. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
that was created with the Barnes deal. It was $1.6 million that we used to spend on maintenance in Forest Park that uh, was replaced by the $2 million Barnes lease. Uh, so since it's general fund revenue, maybe when we do the appropriations for the um, uh, park or the neighborhood park fund, mm -hmm. we have one line, line item citywide that provides for rentals for toilets. And I know the big bandwagon is always in contention because we charge a discounted rate for that. Right. Maybe if you need to rent the bandwagon, you'd rent the bandwagon at a discounted fee mm -hmm. out of there. So that's something we may want to think about. Sure. Yeah, I'll, uh, so I'll talk to the uh, chairman of parks, all the women cruising about it. I sure do. <laughs> uh, and, and I need her help. I wanted to ask you a question, uh, Gary. And I don't know if you have anything in place. And I, I've had some conversation with Lyda about it. And the problem that I'm, I'm really receiving in so, several of my parks, we get a lot of illegal vehicles pull up in the grassy area of the park. And I call the police. And they come sometime, promptly, and sometimes they don't. But even when they get there, they, I don't really think they have a tool in place to give them a ticket, okay, to kind of encourage them. I'm not going to park here anymore because I was charged whatever amount. Do we have anything in place like that? David, there's an ordinance. There's an ordinance that in the city, I don't know that off the top of my head, but there is an ordinance against parking off of graveled or paved areas. Okay. Do we know the fine or how much? I don't, don't know. I can okay. get that information and send it to okay. you. I appreciate it because it may not be much, but I would be more than happy to increase the oh, fine and, and, uh, okay. and, you know, give a tool to the police department. So, uh, you know. The other thing you might do is call our 24-7 number uh, at parks because we do have usually three rangers. Okay. Rolls on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. That might be able to go by there, and our guys love to give out tickets. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's two eight nine fifty three hundred. That's a twenty four seven. Yeah. Okay. That is it. Wow. Two eight nine fifty three hundred. Uh, if if it's after hours. It's fifty. It's fifty three fifty if it's after hours. Oh, fifty three fifty. I'm sorry. Uh, you get that 5350. Okay. If you have a problem where a ball team shows up to play ball mm -hmm. and the comfort station's locked up, right. you can call that number. We send a ranger by to open up the station. If you have ball field lights and a team shows up and the lights aren't on, mm -hmm. the ranger goes out and turns the lights on. Um, <coughs> you got issues like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that down at Wilmore Park. Larry's gone. Uh, we'll send rangers by to chase the car racers out of Wilmore Park. Uh, so yeah, we, we can respond. Police are, would hopefully be faster. Right. But uh, that we do respond to stuff like that. Yeah. And that, that problem generally occurs like in the evening. Or it may be noon time or, yeah, you know, it's just. Park the park right. Guy, yeah, you know, and it, it really damages the ground, especially if it's wet, you know, and it kind of messes up the ball field and the playgrounds and all that. And I guess I guess I'll get with uh, Mr. Skillman on the fine amount of uh, illegal. Okay. All right. That's all I had. Thank you. There was a question about the phone number again. Or, what was your question? I was just saying, Gary. I was just 289. No, it's not that. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not that. What I guess my question is, since it's going to be under the police, Might have been you. is that number going to change, or are they going to want us to go through no, the police? Yeah. You see, part of the range. This is why the liaison is important. There's certain things that the park rangers do for us that we need to ensure continue to be done. One of them is we staff into the 24-7 phone number. So they, they, we will still staff that 24-7 location, which is in our maintenance yard out in Forest Park. So yeah, that number will still be good for rangers. Okay, and when I call the regular number anyway, it transfers over after hours anyway. Right. That's not going to change, I guess. Right. No. Just like when you call forestry after hours for a tree down or storm work, that number transfers to parks with a 24-7 number. Uh, Alderman Cruson had another question. Yes, ma'am. 
Gary or uh, Greg, either way, how many vacant lots do you cut citywide and how many uh, houses? Well, let me say that. Just give us a little over. 22,000 vacant lots wow. with an approximate size of 3,000 square feet and 9,000 vacant buildings. Greg and I did the math on this yesterday. That represents over 2,000 acres of land. And if you think about that number, we have 3,200 acres of parkland. We have 2,000 2, acres of vacant land. So between parks and forestry, we're maintaining uh, 5,000 acres of grass. Uh, and 3,200 is 10% of the city's total acreage. So you add you hmm. double that. So we're maintaining about 15% mm -hmm. of the total acreage within the city of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Moore, did you have another question before we? No. You did? Oh, several others. I know. Gary, in my ward, there are 3,042 parcels that you have to maintain. That's between the lots and the empty buildings. On those lots, when the tractors come, are they required to get off the tractor and remove the trash before they cut it? And have the trash scattered everywhere? Uh, yes, they are. Um, but the problem with always removing trash that's strewn about and thrown everywhere, if we're doing that before every cut, then we're going to be doing these things three to, we're trying to do the best job we can, yes, pick it up, they're responsible. But if we're picking up trash every rotation, we'll do about three to four rotations a year instead of seven. I mean, we didn't put the trash there, and it's just, it's such a major problem. So we just cut it? If it's very small paper and stuff, I, they're not going to pick stick that. But yeah, bigger stuff, we have to pick it up because we're going to hit it with the tractor and cause damage. You know, car batteries, we car We can boats. do the level of maintenance you want. Mm. But I used to have the numbers, what it cost parks to cut an acre of grass versus forestry. Forestry's like, if, if you forget the cost of the garage and gas and insurance and legal fees, it's like, Three tenths of a cent per square foot. If you were at seven, that included uh, comptroller's cost and whatever. Is that about right? I think that sounds about right. I don't know. Yeah, but our actual cost, if you take our budget divided by the acreage we maintain, it's like half of the cost that we charge, our actual cost. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it costs more money to do a better job. Parks cost per acre is probably double what cars. Well, I, I know you guys didn't put it there, but uh, when you cut it and it scatters everywhere, then it's more difficult to pick it up. And when you got over the, the over 1,900 and possibly 3,000 lots that I have, it, it's, it's, it looks better uncut if you're going to just cut the cut the the trash in it. It looks better when yes, sir. And if you can do that, if you can go through and punish us without cutting the grass seven times, you say seven, I say three, uh, then, then, then do that to the citizens. Well, but uh, we, don't, we don't need nothing that, that ugly. When you cut it, most of the time when they cut it, it lay it down and because it's so high, it don't cut it, it stand back up the next two days. So I don't, don't, it don't bother me. I mean, I just let the citizens, all 13,000 of us will be down here raising some sand about why we're not getting the cuts that we should get and we pay the same taxes as everybody else pay. I mean, I didn't ask. You, you're making the suggestion, but you're making the suggestion. I say it looks bad. It looks better uncut. It looks better uncut because of the way you cut it. It doesn't look right. Well, I'm not going to penalize anybody in the ward either because you're saying that you didn't put it there. That was a, I think that was a, no, that came from your guy said that it looks, you know. The bike racks, the memo on the bike racks, $5 a bike rack now? 
Can we get that information to tell us why you raised it for five dollars a bike rack on city events? Probably cost of delivery again. Yes. What does streets charge? Streets charge. Okay. I believe it. Alderman in Florida. Yeah. Gary, I wanted to revisit a comment that you just made that I, I think could be quite impactful. Um, what I heard you say was that the one point six million in the general is general fund money that goes to neighborhood parks. Um, one point two of the one point six. Okay, one point two of the one point six is general fund. Um, that's diverted to it's neighborhood all parks. General fund, right. Only one point two go to parks. Right. Goes to Our biggest issue is with capital. We can't deliver additional services off the capital. So, um, if grass cutting is a priority, and getting those lots cut sufficiently, and the amount is one point two million, and it's a matter of an ordinance and priority, we we could reprioritize and make the grass cutting a priority with, with general fund money. And so I just wanted to thank you for bringing that to our attention, that that's completely doable. I did that by mistake, by the way. Did you? I didn't do that intentionally. Okay, thank you. But, yeah. but thank you. Thank you. Alt, do you have a question here? Yeah, I just had one. Um, in terms of illegal dumping uh, pickup, um, what is the process on that? Because um, I was told that uh, that if I ran out there and took a picture of it and uh, sent it in, that that'll uh, make it get picked up faster. But that that seems not to be the case. Um, in terms of illegal dumping, obviously they reported to Citizen Service Bureau and the Trash Task Force with Sergeant Hasty. We work with him every single day. We take a look at it. A lot of t there's times where he wants us to leave it alone to check for evidence that may be in there. As soon as we get the green light from him, we remove it and there's no charge. But if Joe Citizen calls us every week or every month that say they've been illegally dumped upon, we're going to look at that closely and say, hey, look, you know, you got the one break because obviously the 90 year old woman didn't put it there behind her property, but that individual is still responsible for their property from the midpoint of the street along property lines to the midpoint of the alley. So we'll look at that even more closely. But they need to call CSB, the police, and we remove illegal dump debris all the time. Other times it's property owner negligence, and we'll bill the citizen after a notice. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Alderman Cruz and, and then to Flowers. Last question. Of the 22,000 vacant lots and 9,000 vacant buildings that you cut, how many are owned by LRA? I think uh, last check when we started our grass cutting in April, I think it was probably 35 to 40 percent, right around 40 percent LRA, um, majority private. And how much does LRA transfer to you for the cutting? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's, <laughs> that's an annual question. Um, the answer to that question is, I've looked at the budget. There's been times when they've given us 225,000. There are other times when it's been sporadic, obviously, and they have not. Uh, I don't know where the 225 came from, but I want to stress and emphasize every year the 225 is not extra money. It's included in our seasonal grass cutting employees budget, so it's not extra. So they don't increase your budget. Never. They replace funds that you already had with the LRA money. That's correct. It's included, not increased. So it's just, it's part of what we need. It's not extra, which is what we really need. Right, I hear you. Thank you. All the moon flowers. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I just want to say, I just love, love, love me some forestry. Maybe you need to pull a sweetness on that, but I, I, I have gotten at everything. When we had the storm on April 28th, I mean, the response was immediate. Uh, when I thought the Parks Department was cutting Riverview, it was forestry out there cutting trees. And everything I've asked, even outside of what they should be doing, they have always done for me. So I want to thank you for that. Um, but I please encourage the, the committee to, to add that 100000 to keep it going. Because if you have 1,900 lots, then I probably have 1,300. And that's one of my biggest complaints is grass. But if you're going to pick the trash out and it means you're going to slow down, don't do it. Just cut it up. We'll sweep it up. I'm okay with that. Um, 
I want to know what is the policy for backyards, though, of vacant properties? On all vacant buildings on our rotation, they're responsible for the front and the rear. Now, there's some that are so overgrown that really require extensive services. That's okay. Normal rotation. Um, for instance, there's some wards where, you know, we've driven it numerous times. They're rough, but they're responsible for the front and the rear. We do, this was pretty much a wash this year. Gary's referring to spraying Roundup and pre-emergence in the rear of LRA buildings only in the rear. Okay. A lot of, most aldermen don't want any spraying in the front. It makes it look burn up yeah. and bad. But we do spray, but with all the rain and the cold season, it was pretty much a wash this year. We spray them to expedite our frequency, but we're not adept and perfect at that. That's only frank. LRA buildings. That's correct. Okay. We don't, because if you spray privates and it could drift, in the wind, what have you, it causes us major problems with okay. owners. Easements, I always get questions about easements, and I know easements are public right-of-ways, they don't belong to the city, um, and they basically become forced on their own, because it's, the, I always say the city doesn't plant trees in alleys or easements, they were weeds at one time, they became trees. What, what do you generally say to people when they ask for their easement or to be clear. I mean, I know you can't get back there in some cases, but, and I know you've helped me out in some cases, right. but what do you generally say to a resident? Well, it's their responsibility. Okay. And it's private, it, private abuts private. And it's their responsibility. Now, we have had some community efforts. We've had some effort. I just spoke to a woman about Garrison yesterday, actually, 6,000 block. Um, but yes, they're responsible for it. Now, we have had some community efforts where we've gone in there and, and, and done some nice things. I believe in Alderman Carter's where we did that somewhere as a one-timer, and then they maintained it from there on out. Okay. But what happens is it's usually 10 people in an alley, one, op, one property owner is very vigilant and cuts it, the other nine don't, and that person gets frustrated. But it's, he knows it's his responsibility. Right, right. I tell people, you know, you could even fence it in as long as you let the utility workers get in, but you can maintain it. It's right. not a problem. Um, finally, Amron Yui has responded to the storm, and they're coming out and meeting with me next week to talk about cutting those trees and the easements. I know they cut around the wires, but in this case, in the, the, the magnitude of the lightning strikes, it, it didn't do any good because those lines just came down. So hopefully they'll be working with me, and I won't need you to do anything, and they will get it done for those residents. Um, and the, that's all I have for you. Thank you. Well, I wanted to just say thanks for your kind words. I'll relay them. I was standing there. They were doing all the work. I so got nope. some for you. I got, I got a surprise up my sleeve. It's coming. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> and Dan, I, I want to thank you also for the fountain. The fountain is done. I know it was lit up last weekend, but the way the, the circle looks right now, I know the water department is working. Um, we need to get that together. So hopefully in a couple of months we can actually have the ceremony with the dedication of the two people I'm honoring inside that circle. And my question is, can we use our park improvement funds? I know that's not a park, but can we use that for that particular circle? If I can't afford the fencing, can I use that as a park project? Okay, good, because that was saving money. I've, I've nixed the fencing around the fountain, and I'm going to try next year to just do the entire circle um, and just save up for that. But, you know, we got to get that, the choices for the residents. They want the choices of the planting so we can get started and get going. And Operation Brightside is going to work with us in doing some planting as far as giving us flowers. So I just want to thank you very much. Thank you. Alderman Vaccaro. I just, one more thing just to clarify. I know we keep saying 100, but isn't it? It's 100 plus with the trucks and everything. It's 200 plus the one position, right? 100,000. This is far as great. Right. 100,000 into 112, 50,000 in the fuel account, and 20,000 in the equipment rental account. And you're going to send us? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify it. So it's 200 out one. Roughly. Okay, thank you. He's going, you're going to send. I'll send it to the chair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And to. Oh, we'll send it to the That's fine. Okay. 
for the other questions from members of the committee? Any other, all the people who are here who have a question? If not, I believe that, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, then. And that completes our agenda for today. Uh -huh. Our next meeting.